music would be good <laughs> at this part of the program. It would be very, it'd be very good. As the book is being introduced, it has nothing to do with age. And today's guest is in this book. It has nothing to do with age. In fact, he's in a couple places, one of which, of course, is chapter 13, 12 and 13. But in any event, I'd like to, um, first of all, acknowledge <laughs> on, my, uh, <laughs> on my left, my far left. Uh, Tony, it, yes. Oh, still, <laughs> it's yes, still, still Tony. Still Tony. <laughs> and, and actually, the three of us were <coughs> running this morning. And what came up <laughs> was called the three <laughs> S's, or S cubed. <laughs> S cubed. There's an S for Tony. <laughs> There's an S for our guest Jonathan and friend <laughs> Jonathan Jordan. And an S for me. However, I'm not allowed to convey in public what that represents. It's an acronym. And I'll just leave it. Because you may have heard what, what you hear on the trail stays on the trail. <laughs> and it's important, <laughs> believe me, as they will acknowledge, <laughs> it's important to <coughs> leave it on the trail. <coughs> and I may share it with Linda afterwards. But at this particular point, it, it's, it's just between the three of us. Uh, Jonathan is a man of many talents. And so we're going to find out a little bit about Jonathan and some of his exploits, both as far as his mental toughness goes, and also he's also a defense attorney in, uh, in California with an office in uh, San Diego. But in any event, Jonathan, we're going to start with a quote by Robin Williams, and I'd like you to relate this quote to you. Um, it's per Robin. You're only given a little spark of madness. You mustn't lose it. Okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> you mean relate it to myself? Well, who else? Okay. You're Sounds really like our run. Well, today. I want to know who I want to know who gave me the spark. <laughs> 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 I'm not so sure it was just a spark. <laughs> Nevertheless, um, I think that probably what it means to me is that you develop your own personality in such a way that differentiates you from the, uh, the people around you and the community you're in and makes you an individual. Now, as you live your life and as you choose to exhibit what your characteristics are, the length to which you go to differentiate yourself from the public, from the masses, from the other people, <laughs> is how big the spark is. I think that spark is, is <laughs> no huge. It's huge. And in fact, <laughs> well, the spark, this forest fire. Yeah, the spark could become <laughs> fire size at some point. <laughs> and where it goes from there, nobody knows. But but I think for me, that's pretty, pretty much the way I would relate it. So you're marching to your own drummer. I think we all do. It's just how each of us, you know, what the dance looks like. Okay. Well, I know part of that dance is mental toughness. And I'd like you to relate and tell us about your mental toughness, where you think it got developed. But we've had conversations about mental toughness. And I'd like you to elaborate on the idea. Mental toughness, uh, referring back to the conversations we've had and with Tony. Um, initially, my first feelings about that are, I think mental toughness is initially in the eye of the beholder. I think that it's very similar to people that refer to other people as heroes. And then when those people are spoken to, they don't really see themselves as heroes. But if you have to put the term mental toughness and apply it to someone, I think for my, myself, it has, it has to do with first establishing parameters 
on how you're going to define it. And secondly, will you I, define it? Mental toughness to me is essentially uh, an individual that, can, that, that has the mental toughness, um, basically sees a goal and doesn't really see obstacles that people normally would in the achievement of that goal. Now, whether you want to call that he's, the person is committed to that <coughs> wholly, whether the person, regardless of what any type of uh, outside information or other distractions may occur, he's not going to be deterred from his goal. You know, it has different, it has different feelings and definitions, but generally, the definition I would apply to it is an individual that puts a goal in front of him and really doesn't see a distraction or an obstacle to the goal. So when we did the 100 mile ride and tie, how clear were you are, were you of the obstacles? I really didn't see an obstacle that, <laughs> you know, you and I couldn't overcome. <laughs> I had never, you know, clearly I had never gone that far with you and uh, Gypsy, the horse. Mm -hmm. We'd done a lot of races, but it became more of the pursuit of an adventure rather than something that, if you sat down and thought about it, would be so grueling and would be so never-ending that you would get turned off by it. It didn't take you long to agree to do it. Exactly, because I was doing it with you. <laughs> <laughs> but It's always easy to start. That's right. <laughs> and so you just have to keep the easy to start idea, you know. <laughs> but I really didn't, I didn't view it as something that there was anything that could happen short of breaking a leg or something that was not something we could overcome. Blisters, fatigue, whatever, were all things that we knew we were gonna have to deal with, but there, there was nothing that was you know, preventative that was gonna stop but us from getting through it. But something did happen well, towards the end of the... Yes, it did, <laughs> and, and it was something that nobody ever could have thought about. <laughs> <laughs> it almost stopped it, but not because we gave up, just because we would have been disqualified, but... Because? We were running we're out gonna, of time. Well, we're going to go back to the definition, but before mm, we right. did, Tony raised the good questions. Well, how did metal, well, how did, how did metal Tempest, you know, come into play during that time? Well, what the for everybody the last ten percent. miles, right? Well, wh what everybody <clears throat> doesn't know that that's, that's going to watch this is that about midnight, I got lost in the dark and had never been on that trail before. And at certain aid stations, you have cut off. You have to be there at certain times. And Frank had taken the horse and gone way ahead of me. And there were no markings. I wasn't lost. Frank wasn't <laughs> lost because Frank, you know, the horse knew where it was going. <laughs> Frank didn't. And there were no markings. And I got, I have to say, I went on one trail and it ended up in somebody's front yard. Well, the dog started barking. So that was the time <laughs> to leave that area. So you knew then. Yeah. Got back and said, well, I'll just, and I still don't know how this occurred, how this unfolded the way it did, because I ended up at the proper place, or at least I ended up on the road that took me to the proper place. But you're right. I got very discouraged and at times thought, what's the point, you know? But then if you've done this and you've done other things before that required a certain mental toughness, you get you go and have that conversation and you know what you're doing to yourself. And so you just kind of laugh at yourself <laughs> and say, yeah, okay, next. You know what some of the thoughts that I had during that, because I was worried. Tony, I hadn't seen Jonathan, mm -hmm. it's been a long time. People are on their horses, because there was an endurance ride going mm -hmm. on at the same time. 
<laughs> and they're passing me, and I said, have you seen my partner, Jonathan? <laughs> no. no. And everybody said, no. So I'm thinking, what am I going to tell Tara? <laughs> what, if John, what if I never see Jonathan again? What if, he fell in a sinkhole. <laughs> he just disappeared. He just disappeared. Jonathan disappeared. Tara, I, I just don't know. That was right. some of the thoughts that I had. Well, I don't know how many extra miles I ran off mm -hmm. trail, but I was, I was out there a long time, and, I, you know, the idea of, well, if I could just get to the place, I don't care if we finish, occurred to me a couple of times. Okay. But you recognize when you, you know, depending on how you've lived your life and done certain things that most people think that spark of madness have grown into, a lot bigger thing, you know what you're doing to yourself. And so it's almost a mirror that you're talking to, and the mirror finally says, come on. Get going. You know what's up. <laughs> you know you're not quitting. So keep moving. Don't, you know, don't have to slow down now. Just, and so that, I think, is an example. Now, other people may have different ways of doing it, but I think that's an example of mental toughness. It's when you know what your mind is doing to convince you that this particular feat or this particular action is a little more than you thought and you start creating the rationalization for not completing or not finishing or not pursuing the goal anymore. The mental toughness comes in when you then take that to the next level and you say, okay, we know where this conversation's going. Just shut it down and let's go. Would you say that then by running every day or five, to six days a week then it takes mental toughness to go out in the morning or evening? And well, I think initially it takes a lot of mental toughness because it's, you know, it's, it's not enjoyable at the level that it is at other times each and every day. And so you develop this routine that at times can be boring too. But once it becomes part of your life and once you recognize that a lot of the fact a lot of the reasons you feel good not only about yourself but physically is due to that then again your mind takes another look at this and it says well if i don't do it will i feel bad and sure enough you do, do. <laughs> yeah you yeah and so you know, I think <coughs> mental toughness has to be viewed in much of a literal way because <coughs> of, the, of, the, of the word mental. Mm -hmm. it, 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 a lot, 90 percent of this is mental. Between our ears. Between our ears because it is so easy in every walk of life to rationalize a way, to discuss a way, to ignore a way. Uh, certain things that are in your life that will certainly turn you away from what you're trying to do or want to do. Mm -hmm. And so you just have to turn that conversation that's slowing it down into the other conversation, which is, I know what you're doing. <laughs> See, two, that's, that happened in 2008. In 2008. In 2009, I think, is another example of your mental toughness. Oh. Would you care to tell us about, and you know what I'm referring to. Sure. Well, I was diagnosed with head and neck cancer in 2009. Um, for the people that don't know, one of the things they can relate to is the coach of the Nuggets, George Carl, had that two years ago. And then Michael Douglas, the actor, was diagnosed mm -hmm. with it. Um, it's a very, it's a treatable form of cancer, but, it's, but the treatment is very brutal because of the area that the radiation has to go through, and that's your throat. And Tell us how the, that affects. Well, you, you have to have chemotherapy, and you have the radiation which affects your throat area, and it goes through your neck. And I couldn't eat solid food for, I think, seven months. And so I had a feeding tube, and you lose weight, and... <laughs> you do reach points that 
all of the things that you believe you have started with in terms of trying to talk yourself into getting through this become almost, well, you can't remember the talks. And then the discouragement at your inability to do simple things like walk or try to get up and go to the door or try to talk to people and the way you look physically phys everything <laughs> it just becomes such a discouragement and painful it's it, because the radiation creates second-degree burns in your mouth and in your throat and you know you lose sleep your whole body mechanism becomes turned upside down and in addition to the nausea created by the chemo and anyway you reach a point in those processes and I'm I'm sure there are other people that have gone through cancer treatments that share some of the same things and that is you just don't really care anymore about well you don't you, you don't have some people may but you don't I never really had a suicidal tendency okay but if the pain stopped right now and I didn't wake up you that didn't. wasn't something I was really afraid of right and so that much pain yeah, you don't really, you, you reach that point in the, de, you know, the deterioration of your body. So this is constant pain? Sure, it burns all the time, and I, it's a personal choice on my part, but I never, I never took the morphine, or I never, and I never took the other serious, serious pain medications. Why was that? Well, I, I have a, um, I have a feeling I'd like that stuff too much. And so I just decided that wasn't a good thing for me to do. Even if that would take away the Well, I, you know, again, even pain medication is something that's very mental. Mm -hmm. Because in reality... You want all, more. Yeah. You're always going to want more. You not more. only want more, but it's fooling you into believing you don't have the pain. Right. And so it was just a very difficult process for me adapting to it because I had to do the process. I had to go through the process. There was no way around the process. But adapting to it and understanding it and dealing with it was what was difficult for me. And I just, you know, you count minutes at times until you can have some relief, whether it's from vomiting or whether it's from... You not eating. Vomiting? Well, you, you just, anything that's different that expels bad stuff. Okay. You is, feel better for a few minutes. Yeah. yeah. Visu you visualize yourself <laughs> feeling better. And so when you get to that level, and I, you know, I'm hesitant to use the word existence, but when you get to that level of living, it's a very discouraging, very non you know, it's a non-stimulating way to live. And if you can't be stimulated... You so how did you keep strong? Well, I had my boys. My boys at the time were seven, eight, and nine. And, and you know, the belief that I didn't want to leave them. You know, and my wife, of course, and the family and my animals. And, you know, the idea of leaving that is not an alien idea, but all of a sudden measuring it against what I was going through you know when you look at the things that are important in your life all of a sudden mentally again you can view what you're going through as kind of small and so as long as I could small compared to what I would be losing what you'd be losing you see as long as you can somewhat minimize it as long as you can mentally minimize it compared to the, the greater good, that will sustain you through the process. It'll, you, but you have to keep doing it. You have to keep remembering what it is that we're doing here. What's the point here? What's the point? That's it. And you cannot take your eye off of that ball because if you do, and you all of a sudden start trying to change what the point is or what the goal is, you have to then redo a whole new mental process for that, and I wasn't equipped for that. You, 
you did s some other things on your own beyond what the medical people wanted to do. You did some of your own research and sure. did some things, I, feeding, healthy, right. how you ate. And right. And I still believe that I had some and developed some ideas with regard to that that, well, at least for me, were tremendously created a tremendous advantage for me dealing with it. And it had to do with juicing and, you know, smoothies of vegetables that I couldn't eat or drink, but that I could put through my feeding tube. Because one of the bad things that, one of the worst things that happens is your gastrointestinal system just goes to nothing because you don't have the necessary ingredients and nutrients to keep it alive and well. And I knew at some point that had to change. And so before I ever finished the chemo and the radiation, I was already putting in, you know, fresh right. vegetables and uh, fruits. Tell us what the smoothie consisted of. In this, in my instance, the smoothie consisted of primarily all green matter. It consisted of spinach, kale greens, collard greens, parsley, mints, um, and occasionally I would put in a beet or a carrot, but I would break that down in a, in a, in a, in a, in a very powerful blender with, uh, you know, aloe vera juice and other juices that would make it almost pure liquid so because it's hard to go through that tube and you know you have to push it through real slow and it takes time but with time it became one of the best things that I ever did for me in terms of not only sustaining myself through the treatment but then for recovery because the recover when you stop the treatment, that's not the end of it. It's the recovery from the treatment takes several weeks just to not do it anymore because your body's used to that. And it was not a fun it was not a fun process. So Well, one of your goals that we had talked about was running way to cool. Right. And so we're talking about treatment at the end of uh, 2009. Yeah, the treatment actually ended the first week in September from me going to get the radiation treatments. But then it was another three months before I could begin to put solid foods, swallow solid foods. And way to cool is in March. Right. So you didn't have much training time right. to get ready for that 50K. Right. One of the other aspects of, I think, what we're discussing here, mental toughness, is um, setting goals which are realistic, but which are also somewhat, some people would say, fantastical. In other words, look at it and say, well, that's a nice, that's a nice goal, but, you know, I don't think so. And I've always been one to set the bar, so to speak, higher than what most people would think would be a good setting. And again, going back to Robin Williams's, you know, <laughs> quote, depends on how big that spark is. <laughs> right. So I remember talking to you at the time, and I can't and never will be able to thank you for the support you gave me emotionally in terms of whether you believed it or not, telling me that we could do it. And I would constantly, I probably bugged you to death, but I would constantly call you to give you updates on how I was doing and what I was doing and everything, and you kept assuring me it was gonna be just fine. And, you know, I needed to get into the race, not to run it, but to prove to myself that I had completely overcome this affliction, mm -hmm. that it was not something that was going to affect me, not mm -hmm. just for when I was going through it, but it was not going to affect me for the rest of my life. And the sooner I could get back to a normal life that you and me knew, mm -hmm. the more I was assured in my own mind 
that this was not the monster that I had been led to believe it was. You can, yeah, you beat it. What do you, well, re what you, you even, you, even you were there, Tony. No, I was, I know I was What there. do you remember about that, that run? I remember he was tired. <laughs> wow, he was real skinny. <laughs> he was really skinny. Skinny yeah. and tired? <laughs> yeah. And he, and he loved going up, uh, loved main going bar. up Main Bar. Main bar, yeah. <laughs> Show it to me. Show <laughs> it to me. Where's Main Bar? I can't. But I he can't. finished. I do remember he, he finished. You fi finished. Right. You did finish. <clears throat> and again, you know, I, it's it's clicheish, and probably overused. But the goal was to finish. I didn't have a set time that I needed to do it in. It was just to finish it. Not just. Well, not just because I enjoyed it. Because I enjoyed being with you, I enjoyed I enjoyed the I enjoyed doing what we have always done. Mm -hmm. But there were times when I didn't think I was going to finish it. Well, sure. And I, you know, and again, then what, what did you tell yourself if you remember during those times? Well, I, it was the same sort of rhetoric I was going through when we were doing the hundred miles. You have to carry it past the negative, if you will aspects of the conversation to laughing at yourself because you see what you're doing to yourself and you take your mind back to okay what was the plan what was the plan in November what was the plan in February and here we are why is the plan changing and so you have this little dual conversation with yourself and I contend that if you're mentally tough, the conversation side of it that pushes you on is the side that will out-talk the other one. And basically by saying, mm -hmm. I know what you're doing. If your daddy was with you at that particular time, what might that conversation <laughs> have looked like? If, if, we, if, he, if you transported your daddy. <laughs> <laughs> My father was a very extraordinary person, and he had, he loved sayings, <laughs> somewhat like your quote about the spark of madness. Um, one, of the favorite, one of his favorite sayings had to do with change, and it had to do with uh, when you recognize something in you that you don't like. And he would say, it's not a sin to have a dirty comb, but it's a sin to keep one. <laughs> and so, you know, it, it wasn't bad for me to have the negative thoughts. Those were perfectly okay. That's true. But you better not keep them. Smart man. You better get rid of them because if you don't, then that's when bad things happen. Your daddy had other sayings. Oh, he would say things like, whenever I thought too much of myself or I thought mm -hmm. I was really something, he would remind me that the size of a man's funeral is going to depend on the weather. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, at the time, I just attributed it to this old man that didn't know what he was talking about. And Daddy, that's why, da that's why I'm, Daddy, you're not cool like me. And so I attributed it to a mm. lot of different things, but... It's funny how we remember certain things and how certain things that had significance in your life at the time, even if you didn't know the significance, stay with you. And he died in uh, 2000. And mm -hmm. even before that, I began to appreciate how he raised me and what he tried to convey to me because I come from a big family. There were four boys and a girl. And he in what part of the country? I come from, well, <laughs> I come from the deep, deep south in Georgia, in deep south Georgia. And so I grew up in a rural town where storytelling and where oral and where, you know, the, the spoken word is a much more powerful, it's a much more powerful medium than, I love to read, but it's more powerful than that. And so... His teachings stayed with me and with years took on different meanings and, and, and became much more significant. So that now 
I'm teaching those same things to my three boys who are, you know, still impressionable and not yet at the age where they can say, Daddy, you're not mm -hmm. cool. <laughs> are you sure? Are you sure? Well, <laughs> I haven't heard it yet. Okay. Although I do find once in a while I'm being ignored. <laughs> no. Nevertheless, yeah. Now, your daddy was an attorney. <laughs> yes. And... He, as I recall, he was involved in the uh, 60s in the civil rights yes. movement. He was in the rural town. We, the Freedom Riders, I don't know how many people watching may remember that. Maybe you would tell us a little bit about it? The civil rights movement was, obviously it was nationwide, but what people remember and what you know, the country remembers is the difficulties that that movement and the people that were involved in that movement encountered in the South, particularly places like Mississippi and Alabama. Georgia, of course, mm -hmm. South Carolina. All of the South posed a lot of problems for the civil rights movement for reasons that are historical and well known. Um, my father, however, took a different position, not that he was by himself because there were other people that believed like he did, but he believed that all, that everybody had an equal right to achieve the same types of goals and have the same aspirations as everybody else. And in the process of believing that, he, he exhibited it. He's he, an attorney. He was an attorney. He was, he, he, he helped and assisted the Freedom Riders. The Freedom Riders were people that came from the north to go through and help set up the polling stations because voting was not something that... It was problematic back then. It was then very for, problematic. Yeah. And everybody <laughs> remembers the murders that occurred in Mississippi and other places as a result of those... Mm. Uh, you know, that assistance from the North. He Those kids. Yes. He represented uh, before uh, Gideon versus Wainwright. That's the one where the Supreme Court said that you have a right to an attorney um, in certain cases. He represented black people before that became the law. And he just... So is he like... Atticus? Well, that's the, my, my oldest son's name. When I, it's funny you'd say that. When I went to the movie and saw To Kill a Mockingbird, <laughs> I thought it was my daddy that was, on the, that was portrayed by Gregory Peck. And so I named my oldest son Atticus in remembrance of that. But yes, he had, he had that country lawyer. That's what's on his tombstone. He was just a country <laughs> lawyer. Okay. He had but that. he really wasn't just the country lawyer. No, he, he was philosopher. He was, you know, magician. He was... But even in the military, he was... He was, a judge, he was in the Judge Advocate Corps in Korea and saw a lot, of, a lot of suffering and a lot of hardship in Korea. That was a, that was a big, big event for him in his life. He's, he, he used to tell me he didn't talk much about the war, but... Korea was a, was a hard place for him to be with regard to all of the suffering and the poverty that existed. Among the people? Among the people, yeah. And so when he came back, he, you know, he practiced in a real small town. Douglas, Georgia is a small town. And uh, it's grown. It's bigger today, but it's still a small town. Is USA. that where you grew up? That's where I grew up, yes. Near the, some people may, may know where the cartoon characters Pogo come from, the Okefenokee Swamp. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that's what I come from, and I came to the land of whatever in how'd California. You, well, how'd you end up out here? Well, people ask me that, and I tell them in my 1968 GTO. <laughs> <laughs> but... <laughs> Were you carrying beer across the yeah, uh, state line? all those cores were coming the other way. Right. Um, I finished, I, I, I basically came to California on a dare. I'd gone that summer, I'd started my law school career at uh, Drake University in Des Moines, Iowa, 
and I'd gone home for the summer and some friends and I were out having some beers and celebrating the summer and I was telling them about we were all we always grew up think seeing the you know the the news about California and the bikinis and the volleyball <laughs> and California as a southern boy was was a place <laughs> but it was mystical it wasn't real you know and so we all were talking about it one night over beers and sitting on the hoods of cars and that kind of stuff and I opened my mouth that's what said, you did in southern Georgia that's what you did a lot of okay. yeah and indicated that uh, I could go to California if I wanted to because I'd gotten accepted to law school out here mm -hmm. and of course that brought a whole round of brujas and yeah <laughs> rights and all this kind of stuff well I was in it now <laughs> <So> <laughs> To put mm -hmm. my money where my mouth was. Mm -hmm. Is this part of mental toughness? It might be because driving out here was a lot. <laughs> or it might be that spark. Yeah, I had yep. some spark. Then. <laughs> yeah. That grew into a fire as I was crossing. On, I came out on Route 66. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> and so I didn't have any friends here. I had hardly any money in my pocket. And so, but I just knew what I had to do. And I suppose that qualifies as mental toughness too because I didn't have anything when You're I You're how old here. at this point? At this point I was 23. Young young man. Yeah, I didn't mm. see obstacles. <laughs> I didn't see things like no money for apartments because in Georgia an apartment was $25 a month. Well, I, could, <laughs> I could afford that. I didn't have a problem affording that. <laughs> so now you're in the Bay Area. Now I'm up here. Yeah. And no, no, I've been here since 1978 now, and you know, I've I've been very lucky. I've been very fortunate. And some people say you make your luck. I don't know how true that is, but I know I've been fortunate. And for whatever part of my existence has been the result of mental toughness that mm -hmm. you know required that exertion of mental toughness to get through I I don't know but but looking back I have to say that if I you know look at the qualitative part of those times that required the mental toughness there is something about those times that uh, there's something appealing about and I think the part of it that's appealing is you do things that you never thought of doing. You never thought you could do. You never gave a lot of thought to. And all of a sudden you find yourself doing it and there's a certain degree of satisfaction and enjoyment. What are some of those other things you haven't mentioned maybe? With regard to um, what you get from the mental toughness? Not only that, but the, the goals, the, 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 uh, the things that you're going to do that you hadn't thought about in the beginning in, in the beginning they're more because that might go back to basketball or you but you had told me about a time <laughs> in junior senior high on the football field oh yeah that's and, true and that was a funny story and that may or may not be mental toughness but it was part of your definition when we talked about in terms of making choices and thinking right. about the consequences well, so let's go back to when I was a freshman in high school. And on the football <laughs> field. On the, on the football field. I think that's important right here. Well, as, any, as, as, as I'm sure anybody that's, that's listening or watching this knows, the South is football country. I've the heard S that. The SEC <laughs> is, that's their king. king. It's king. And as a young boy growing up in the South, Playing football, you would think, is in our DNA. You just, you have to do it. And so. Hmm. You had to do it. I had to do it along with my friends because you certainly didn't want to be looked down well, upon. Did your daddy want you to do it? My father was not, was not the kind of ardent parent, southern parent about football that a lot of my friends were. Okay. He was more. He was more interested in academics. If you wanted to play the sports, that was good, but you had to handle 
It was secondary to your. It was always secondary yeah. to the academic. But what he was, what he was unbending on was, if you committed to it, you had to finish it. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that old was, school, old school, school. Yeah. old school, yeah. right? <laughs> and the reason for that was not because of your personal wishes, but because your teammates had learned to count on you, and they were depending on you, and you couldn't let them down. So, I signed up for football, and there we were. And I don't know that many people really know what it's like in August in Georgia, but. <laughs> There's, Hot and humid. There, there's songs that talk about hotter than asphalt <laughs> in Georgia in August. And it was that type of a, of, a, uh, of a summer that year. And you're how big back then? Well, I was, a, I was probably six feet tall, but I probably weighed a grand total of 130. <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> but, you know, the pads were heavy. <laughs> <laughs> Did the helmet weigh you down? The helmet, well, it was wobbly. It was wobbly. You really get a good fit good. <laughs> but, you know, I had it on, and I felt good going out there <laughs> with the rest of them. Because in helmets, you're kind of anonymous. They're all big football players. But there's a number on you. You're yeah, indestructible. You the yeah, with that, yeah. You got that. <laughs> Until we got to the drill where everybody has to circle up, and the coach... I've this is funny, Tony. Well, this is it's funny. not that funny. <laughs> where the coach calls your number, this number that has given you identity, and you have to go to the center, and you do those little leg pumping drills and everything, and then he calls another number, and that person is supposed to come out, and you have to get down and hit each other. <laughs> but you don't know where it's coming from. So that is supposed to develop some sort of agility. Okay. <laughs> well, I saw the first couple ahead of me do this. And all of a sudden, I wanted my number to kind of blend. <laughs> well, that was the first dead giveaway that Jordan's next. <laughs> and so I got into it, and as, as we talked about some of the mental toughness that uh, goes along with some of the events in our lives, you start asking, what am I doing here? <laughs> and I was in my position, and I got down in my position, and all of a sudden, my friend, who became my friend for years, Jamie Walker, okay. who was a lineman. <laughs> <laughs> he probably had more weight than and you. He weighed <laughs> more than 130. He got <laughs> called, and here he came. And he literally picked me about three feet <laughs> off the ground. And that was when I wanted to end that process. Mm -hmm. And excuse me, excuse me, sir. <laughs> this is a very interesting conversation. We would really love to hear what you're saying. So we're gonna try and put your mic back on. <laughs> We're oh, we're oh. somewhere. It's right. Right so here. we would love to be able to hear you. So if you don't mind, go ahead. We will just make <laughs> sure. You like the story? Well, I like it. I think you I'm like going to like it. I know that these guys like it because they're laughing their heads off. And we can't <laughs> know what it's about. Oh, you don't know so, what it's about. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, let's go back to. Uh, Thank you. Where did we stop? <laughs> oh. So oh, there'll be editing. Let's go. I let's, guess. Go, well, no. Let's go back oh, to. It's um, alive. Let's go back to Georgia football. <laughs> Okay. So, anyway, after Jamie Walker hit me hard enough to knock mm -hmm. me about now three... Now, go before to... Go, let's go back and tell... The circle. The circle and 130 mm -hmm. pounds, six okay. feet. I weighed... At the age of 14, I weighed... I was six feet tall and weighed 130 pounds. And joined my friends in their pursuit of football stardom. And your father... My father supported athletics, but only as a secondary, secondary activity to academics. Okay. He was a very big... But if you started something... If you started it, his belief was you had to finish it. Okay. And that, that circled around the idea that other people on so your team counted on you. So now we're in what temperature on the football field and the climate? It's about... It's probably close to 100. The humidity's probably around 95. <laughs> Might as well be raining. <laughs> I got 100 pound pads on. And the helmet probably weighed 25, or at least it felt like all of this. 
and we did the drill where you go you form the circle and the coach calls your number and you have to get down in a position football position and you do the foot motion where you chop your feet and the coach calls another individual to come out and hit you and the idea is you develop the agility to move quickly to get down into a stance to protect another runner or another football player. Well, Clever drill. Well, that's okay if you <laughs> both are of the same size, but the linemen on that team were Jamie. Big, Jamie. Jamie Walker was probably 220. <laughs> Jamie was what we used to call back then corn fed. Corn fed. <laughs> he was big. And he came out after his number was called and leveled me and picked me about three feet up off the ground and pushed me over to the other end of the circle, one side of the circle. And it's one of those things that addles you, we used to say. You, you really got to get the cobwebs out after that kind of thing and wonder. What am do I, I doing do here? I want to get back up and do this again. And so I, pr I think I remember the coach putting me back in and doing it with about two other or three other players. And I went home and said, Daddy, I just don't think this is it for me. But he wasn't very sympathetic with that. And so I finished it that year. Um, and then came basketball season. And basketball was what I considered my cup of tea. <laughs> And so I, I even played baseball that year. Okay. But I couldn't see that ball for anything. And it would come baseball? across the plate. Baseball. Yeah. So and your sport really was basketball. It completely, basketball became my life's obsession. And I love that game even today. And so, matter of fact, I went to college on a basketball scholarship. Really? And so all my brothers, we all played because you know, in those days, people that played athletics, and you probably remember, Frank, the weekends were meant with meeting up with your friends mm -hmm. and playing all day until dark. And, you know, we had a backboard that was nailed to a tree, <laughs> and we had the ground beaten around. And That's you know, a little different than <laughs> the backboard you put together for, for your, the boys. For the I, boys. I bought the boys a, ba a basketball goal from some sporting goods store that, and it came in 3,422 <laughs> parts and Tara had to read the book and measure. They got measurements for the bolts. I knew again <laughs> mental toughness came in because I knew I was in over my head. <laughs> I would have even been happy to not return it and just throw it. <laughs> throw it away. <laughs> throw it away. But I finished it, and the boys are playing probably right now. Um, but, you know, the mental toughness, as we said earlier, contains a lot of elements. And I think that it's just as important when you begin an adventure, when you have set a goal, yeah that you do look at the parameters of those, um, of those goals and what path you're trying to get to it on. Because um, I, I dare say that I have done things before and other people as well that, you know, you look back and say, if I had given that a little more thought, that might not have been the path you know, mm -hmm. I would have chosen. And, you know, with a little thought and with a little consideration for mm -hmm. some of those parameters, I don't call them obstacles because the, the idea of not seeing the obstacles is, is there regardless. Um, You're reframing that. Yes. That's not necessarily how, an obstacle. How, how does it um, relate to your job well before you go related to this i was going to ask jonathan too is your mm -hmm. dilemma this is part of mental toughness too as a defense attorney especially mm -hmm. if you think the person you're representing is guilty 
There is, in my, in my particular field of law, which is criminal defense, there, there always exists a dichotomy between, I, I don't use, the, most people use the word guilty. Okay. I don't use the word guilty because that's reserved for a determination by a judge or a group of people after a presentation of facts. Mm -hmm. But the dichotomy exists between conduct, which is alleged to be criminal, and the person's rights to have that conduct judged in a certain way. And all too often, I think, people, and because all defense attorneys are people, have a tendency to judge and examine the conduct without the process. And our laws, our statutes, give us the process which you have to go through in the legal system to determine that guilt. Mm -hmm. um, or innocence. Or innocence. Um, but the dilemma was much bigger in my early career because you would see certain things and you would hear certain things that you just either were appalled by, shocked <laughs> by, or you know, re, re, you found revolting. The behavior. The behavior. And it took, it took a while to get to the point where the behavior is just a component part of this whole thing. And you, uh, you then look at the process that's going to be utilized to determine, to determine what's going to be the outcome of the judgment of that behavior. But even today, there are certain, there are certain <coughs> things that I have to step back and say when I see certain behaviors, this is not for me to judge. It's not something that I have to question myself about because that's not my job. My job is to make sure that the process that has been given to every citizen of this country is followed and afforded to this individual. Mm -hmm. But you have to develop a certain that's mental... That's the job. That's, that's the job. Okay. And regardless of how <laughs> I feel about what the conduct was and what the result of the conduct was. Mm -hmm. I have this to do. And have I you ever yeah, said no? There I have yes, I have. I very rarely. <laughs> but there have been some cases that I just didn't feel I was up to with regard to the mental toughness because the conduct and the individual, um, along with other circumstances, presented itself to me in such a way that I knew early on that I wasn't up for that. It would be the same as somebody loading up in the airplane and let's go into the bottom of Mount Everest and say, let's go. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could certainly say, okay, <laughs> but you know, you better look at the parameters real quick here. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's that kind of a thing when I was talking about you have to look at certain goals and you have to examine consequences or potential consequences. And I don't believe that the cases I said no to that I, I know I made the right decision. Mm -hmm. And so, but it's, it's another form of mental toughness, I guess. We have just a few more minutes. Is there some brief thing that you want to say about your practice or about a case that you've had? No, not really. Um, a lot of that's personal to people that were involved in those, and so I don't really, you know, without them being here, I don't, you know, I don't like talking about cases unless it's well publicized and people know about it. But I suppose since the topic has been mental toughness and since we've somewhat discussed it both, you know, jocularly as <laughs> well as seriously, um, 
everybody, I believe, has the ability to look at goals, whatever those goals are, whether the goal is to have a healthy family, whether the goal is to be healthy yourself, whether it's to be successful, whatever the goal is, I believe everybody has the ability to go after that goal with an intensity that gives you a better than average assurance you're going to achieve it as long as you don't let the thoughts and let the distractions and let the obstacles become bigger than the goal. Focus, focus, That's right. focus. Remember what you're here for. Remember if you're married and you want to argue, it's not about you and her, it's about the children. Remember that when you want to go out and do this instead of this, it's not about that. It's about going out and training. Remember what you're, and so if you just engage in that internal dialogue, anybody can have what but we you have, call. But you have to know how to rethink it. Exactly. <clears throat> and that's a key. That's a key, and you learn that from people. You talk about it. You practice it. You do it in yourself, and you watch how you evolve. And it's the practice that's important. That's right. You actually can't train yourself. Exactly. Yeah. And mentally tough. Hopefully. And to close it, and to close <laughs> it with another one of my daddy's sayings: "Getting to heaven is heaven." So okay. the practice is where the enjoyment is. Mm -hmm. So give us a. Hey, you told us a couple of your daddy's sayings. Give us one of yours. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, once I had to define for myself, it's funny we talk about it, I, I had to create for my own self when I was doing some introspection, definitions for words. And I decided to define as accurately as I could for myself what happiness meant. And what I concluded was, and I remind myself of this every day, happiness is not having a sense of need or urgency to leave where you are right now. I like that. Well, for me personally, it <laughs> defined pretty much what made me happy. Not the quantitative but the qualitative. Exactly. And so if I didn't need to leave where I was or had a need to get away <laughs> from it right now, then I felt like you're happy. I'm happy. You know, unfortunately, we have a blank, blank screen. <laughs> and I couldn't tell you how happy.